Okay, tonight uh, we're going to be reading from the prophet Isaiah. We're going to start there in the Old Testament. By the way, uh, Pastor Todd sends his regrets. He had to stay home today. He got some guys working on his house. They were supposed to be done yesterday, and they weren't. And uh, so, you know, be praying for him. <laughs> he sends his regrets. But uh, anyway, Isaiah chapter 5. I, uh, last night, or uh, Friday night, we were at the, we were at the uh, camp meeting. And the fellow preaching there was talking about how we're living in a time of chaos. Great chaos. And uh, it's true. A couple of uh, recent news headlines that I'm sure that you have heard are things that we've picked up here or there. There was a, of course, we've all heard about supporters celebrate the coming of same-sex marriage to New York. You've heard that, right? Now, I, I want to say this, and every time I mention something like this, I want to make it clear. I don't hate anybody. I don't, I'm not against gay people. I'm not, but just so you understand where we're going tonight, okay? Here's another one I picked up on the internet. The, the headline says this. U.S. veteran faces legal action for flying American flag. Uh, Fred Quigley, 77, of Macedonia, Ohio, a minister who served active duty during the Vietnam War, has been told by his homeowners association that his flag violates property rules. He's not allowed to put his flag in front of his house. Of course, they can build a mosque on ground zero, but they can't. Okay, now one more, and then we're going to look at God's Word. This one was in uh, this, the valley. Today, I think, or yesterday. I think today. Sex in Atlantic City, casino resort heating up. Ever since gambling started in the nation's second largest casino market in 1978, Atlantic City has been torn about whether to market itself as a family resort or as Sin City East. Guess which side is winning. And there's an article there, you know, about how it's basically talking about how sin is being marketed because it makes a lot of money. And when we, when we look at the nation we live in and the stuff that's going on around us, and many Christians, I know, the things like we read here, there's Christians everywhere that are praying against, you know, same-sex marriages and praying against these things happening, yet they're happening. And I remember one time I was in a prayer meeting with a guy and we were praying about something like that. And, uh, and, it, and it didn't go the way we thought it would. And he was saying, how come God didn't answer our prayer? I said, listen, God will give us what we ask for as a nation. Whatever we ask for as a nation, God will give. He, he will not withhold. Okay? In Isaiah chapter 5, I'm not going to keep you long this evening at all. I don't think. I always say that. Sometimes I'm... Sometimes it's true. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied about 700 years before Christ. He was a prophet to Judah, Jerusalem. This would have been about 2,700 years ago from where we are right now. <clears throat> and when the prophets would speak, when God would speak through the prophets, you know, this morning we had a, a message uh, or Sister Carol, God gave her a message, and it really tied right in. It was like the message of, that I've had to give from the Word. <clears throat> God always has a purpose. He never does anything without announcing His intentions. Now, Isaiah is prophesying to the nation, uh, to Jerusalem, to Judah. And he says this in chapter 5. Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. This is like a parable that he's telling. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, if you, any of you that ever garden, you know what it takes to prepare a garden. Well, a vineyard, if, if, uh, my, my grandfather used to have a grapevine in the back of his house. How many people know what's that? I, I believe Uncle Dominic. Remember Uncle Dominic? He had a grapevine, didn't he, Dora? In the back of his house. And a fig tree. But my grandfather had, always had a grapevine. And 
to prepare that grapevine, it, it, you have to really make sure the soil is right and everything has to be just right. And, and he said he prepared this vine and he had the wine press there. He was all ready for grapes that they were going to pick and make wine. And the problem was that when, when grapes came forth, they weren't the good grapes, they were the wild grapes. And he says in verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now, go, I'll tell you what I'll do to my vineyard. I'll take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, be, but behold, a city. Here's what he's saying. He's telling this story. It's a parable about the city of Jerusalem. 2,700 years ago. God loved His people Israel, and He loved Judah, the tribe of Judah. It was through Judah that Christ would come. And Judah occupied Jerusalem. And God said, I gave you the city, and I gave you my blessing, and I gave you my temple, and I gave you my laws, and I gave you all these things. Yet they still rebelled against Him. And if you read the history of Jerusalem, of Judah, in the Old Testament, of the Israelites, if you read about them in the Old Testament, they continually worshipped other gods, and they, and they bowed down to other gods, and they made sacrifices to other gods, and they brought other gods into the temple. Things that God told them not to do. God was so gracious to them. He, was, he loved them. He took them out of bondage, and He did all these great things for them, yet they still rejected His love. And He's talking about this, this vineyard. And He says, you know, Judah's like a vineyard that I planted, that I really loved, but they went wild on me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let the thing go to waste. And that's what he did to Jerusalem. He allowed uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, to come and conquer them and take them into captivity. Now what did they do? What did they do to cause God to do this? What did... Judah do to make God so angry with him. Look at verse 8. He says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears said the Lord of hosts, Of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yet ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of Omer shall yield an ephah. What is all that about? What he's saying is this. He's saying that what, one of the things they were doing was people were buying up houses and lands. You know, they had a mortgage crisis. The wealthy were buying everything up and charging exorbitant prices for the poor to live there. They were making money. They were buying all these farmlands thinking, well, I'll have you know, one field and join this field to that field and this field to that field. And I'll have all the, all the grapes and all the, all the, all the uh, wheat and all the barley and all these things. And God says, you know what, you can do all that, but I'm going to make it stop raining. I'm going to make it, it's not going to produce anything. You could have acres and acres of vineyard. It'll just give you one little bottle of, you know... You know God can do that. One of the things they were doing was, and it really boils down to this, the wealthy were trying to take advantage of the poor, buying everything up. He goes on and he says this, verse 11. Woe to them that rise up early in the morning. Here's a good one. Woe to them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine and flame them. Man, I can remember those days. Had a day off. We'd start out early. You know. I can remember when, when uh, we used to, I used to get together with friends of mine. When, when, the, uh, when the March Madness would come, you know the basketball tournament? You, NAA or yeah, it's, it's, uh, NCAA, they would have the basketball tournament, 
And so me, friends of mine and I would get together, and all day long, because they show basketball games all day long, and we'd get together and get us about three cases of beer. Okay. And we sit back and we'd watch teams of, of colleges that we never even heard of before. They got, te- you know, we never heard of them. We would rise up early. It says, woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink and continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and the vine and are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. Let's party. They were partying. They, it was a party spirit in Jerusalem. And they didn't care about what God thought. They didn't care about what He uh, demanded of them. But there was this big party going on. And isn't that the way... Look at, look at the world we're living in even right now. It's like a big party. He said, let's rock and roll. Let's rumble. Let's, let's go for it. It's like, let's have fun from day, from morning till night. This is what was going on in Jerusalem. Look at verse 13. Therefore my people are gone into captivity, because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. Man, our nation, man, this is talking about Jerusalem, but let's, let's put this, let's look at the nation that we live in right now. Let's look at our culture. Now we're not God's people. We're not, God's people is the nation of Israel. And I know people say this is a Christian nation. Well, we might have a Christian history, but if you look at our founding documents, I don't see anything about Jesus in any of them documents. Yet, this nation has built itself on one nation under God. It's on our money. Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. We hear about God all the time. We grew up hearing about God. Our founding fathers, even though they might not have been Christians, they believed in some kind of God. God, God, we think about God, the Creator, the Supreme Being. Yet, what has happened? Do, do you think God is pleased with what He sees in the United States of America? Do you think God is pleased when He sees how we have uh, degraded His name? We've turned our back on His Word. Uh, they used to teach kids how to read by letting them read the Bible. Now you're not allowed to have it in school. It says that because of this, we have a nation full of people that are on their way to hell. Because our society, our culture, has, has tried to, to snuff out any thought of God. We don't want, you know, I, I was the one fellow that was speaking at the... At the uh, at the camp meeting. He said, we have raised generations of kids and we've taught them it's, the, the holy grail has been self-esteem. Some people know what I'm talking about. Self-esteem. Well, it's okay to understand who you are in Christ. That's alright. We need to have a godly self-esteem. But what has happened, because we have taught self-esteem, we have, we have neglected to teach self-control. Self-esteem without self-control creates a monster. Because if you feel so good about yourself that you're going to do whatever feels right, you're just going to go ahead and go and do whatever you want. Our culture, this is what was happening in, in that day. Our culture has said, you don't have to worry about a God that, that tells you what's right and what's wrong. You do what feels right. Well, we're going to tolerate everybody. We're going to think everything is okay. And we're going to just going to love and be, everybody's going to be in one big happy family. But God has standards. God has things that He says are right and things that He says are wrong. And when somebody stands up behind a pulpit and talks about that, people say, well, you're being judgmental. You're being No, I'm just telling you the truth. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. I, you know, personally, myself, I don't care what anybody does. I don't. I mean, myself, I mean, I just don't want to see anybody go to hell. Hell is enlarging its borders. Man, there's, there's no standing room. <laughs> you have, Sister Karen went down to a baseball game, took Michelle down to a baseball game Friday night. I said it was packed. Standing room only. There's lots of room in hell. It's, it's, it's opening up its borders. Reading a little bit more. Verse 16. 
But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified and righteous. God that is holy, listen, I don't care what goes on, what we see go on, God is eventually going to get His share. God is going to state His case. He is ultimately, the Bible says, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. God is going to have the last word. Then shall the lambs uh, feed after this manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall uh, strangers eat. Woe unto them, in verse 18, that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. Man, we're just like pulling sin along. Come on, let's go. That say, let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel, it almost mocking God. Hey God, look what we're doing. Go ahead, hit me with lightning. That's what, we've, that's what our culture has said. Hit me with lightning. Come on. Come on, God, look what I'm doing. Strike me dead. And when it doesn't happen, they say, you see? There's no God. They're going to find out there's a God. They don't understand that the reason why God doesn't do it is His mercy. Look at verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. You see... People will say, well, it's all relative. Today, that's the thought today. It's all relative. Whatever you think is good is good for you. It might not be good for me. Whatever is nice for you, whatever you like, you do. Blah, blah, blah. Okay? But you know what? God says there's good and there's evil. God lines it up in His Word. And they can try to laugh at it. They can try to make fun of it. Uh, the entertainment of Hollywood, they make fun of it. They make a big joke out of holiness and righteousness and purity. They make a joke out of that. But God says what's right and what's wrong. And ultimately, that's where we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged according not to what society says, not to the Constitution, not to what some judge says, but we're going to be God, uh, 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 judged according to what this Word says. And it hasn't changed. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the, of the righteous from him. This is what's happening in our society. Evil is being rewarded and righteousness is being condemned trampled on. That's what's happening in our world. That's what's happening in our culture. And if you dare stand up for what God says is right, they'll call you a hypocrite, they'll call you a bigot, they'll call you a homophobe, they'll call you all kinds of names and, and, and make you feel like a misfit. Just what was going on back then. You know, when the prophets would stand up and speak God's word, they would get beat up. They would get thrown in jail. They don't want to hear what they had to say. The little one's okay. It's okay. She can cry. She can say amen. All right. It's okay. That's what they would do to the prophets. They'd beat him up and throw him at Jeremiah. They'd throw him in a sore. For saying what was right. And that's what we're seeing happen. Now, having looked at that, and there's more there, but uh, turn over with me, and of course... I wonder how many preachers, good preachers, preached on Romans chapter 1 this week. <laughs> After <laughs> Romans chapter 1, look, turn there with me. And we're going to read it briefly. Chapter 1 and verse... Uh, we'll start with verse 16. I've asked, I've asked John to, to video this tonight because I want to put it on YouTube. Because when, when people hear stuff like this, they get so angry. When you preach Romans chapter 1, they'll call you every name in the book. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? I hope not. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Thank God for the gospel. 
For therein, in verse 17, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, the Bible tells us, we're saved by faith, we live by faith, the gospel is what, what enlightens us to understand the gift that God gives us through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Do you know how many people hate the gospel? They might tell you that Jesus, all oh, Jesus was a good guy. Thomas Jefferson, one of our, who wrote the Declaration of Independence and most of the Constitution. He believed there was a God, but he hated the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in the miracles. He believed Jesus was a good teacher. Didn't believe in miracles. Didn't believe in virgin birth. Didn't believe in a resurrection. Didn't believe in any of that supernatural stuff because he was a man of reason. He hated the gospel. There are people that they'll say they believe in God, but they hate... You can talk about God all you want to, but when you start talking about Jesus, they start getting antsy. Why? Verse 18. For the wrath of God, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. And the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. God has anger and wrath for those that reject His Son. He's not a big loving God that lets everybody into heaven. That's the, that's the latest thing. Everybody goes to heaven. Well, that would be all right. Uh, you know, that would be nice. That sounds nice. Sounds like, you know, Mr. Rogers, everybody goes to heaven. But God is angry at the sinner. He sent His Son. He expressed His love on the cross at Calvary so that all who go to the cross can be forgiven. But if we reject His offer of love through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are going to be objects of His wrath, according to His Word. The scoffers will laugh at that. They'll make fun of it. They'll call Him a big fairy in the sky. They'll make all kinds of, they'll make all kinds of fun, of, of mockery of what this says. But this is what God's Word says. You can either accept it or reject it. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and un, uh, ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Listen, if we can be alive, and we can, be, and we can understand the life that we have, that we have a, a supernatural sense, how can we deny that there is a Creator? It's just common sense that, you know what, this, this bottle cap, if it sits here for 20 gazillion years, will never reproduce itself. You can get a rock out of your yard and look at it, and look at it for the next 10 minutes. It will never make another rock. But you and our human beings, life all over, life reproduces. If it's a little one cell, little blob floating around in a drop of water, or a human being, or whatever it is, we reproduce. God created us for that. That's, that should be enough to convince anybody when they look at like this little, sweet little girl over here, they say, wow. That should be enough to convince anyone. You remember when you were that old? Of course you don't. All right. Listen to what it says. Verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Back in the, up until about 1850 or 1860, it was commonly believed and taught that God created everything. We were created. There was a creator. Today they use the term intelligent designer. In 1860, Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species, where he said, oh no, no. That's just supernatural. What we really believe is that everything kind of evolved. Well, in the 1860s, maybe that made sense, he would go to places like the Galapagos Islands and, and observe different kinds of life and different 
different ways, different traits, that they had different birds with different beaks and stuff. And he would make this big, he made this, drew this big tree of life that, you know, how it... So everybody, so the scientists started saying, oh, oh, that's how it happened. There wasn't a God that spoke everything into existence that created the robins and created the, the birds and created the, the dolphins and created the whales and created humans. No, th- there was, it happened, it started with just one little, one little speck of, of, of life that popped into existence somewhere. Now that was before they knew about DNA. That was before they had microscopes and electron microscopes that they could look at little enzymes, look at these little molecular motors that work inside of us. That was before they could see all this, all the intricate uh, complexity of life. You know, they just said, well, this, is, this just happened. So starting with uh, Charles Darwin in the, in the uh, late 1800s, they started to, to say, oh, evolution. It says evolution, the theory of evolution. And up until, up until the 60s, the teaching of evolution was illegal in some states. We've all heard the, the, about the Scopes trial and so forth in Tennessee. It was in the 60s that people began challenging laws prohibiting the teaching or, or, or at least limiting the teaching of evolution in school. They still taught creation. But isn't it interesting that... In the early 1960s, something else happened. Two people, one of them's name was Madeline Murray O'Hare. Actually, her name was Madeline Murray at that time. And there was another one, I forget his name. They filed suit in the United States Supreme Court against prayer in school. They said, I don't want my kid praying in school. I don't believe in that. And our, our, our wonderful Supreme Court decided, well, that's right. We can't let them kids pray in school. And if you, if you look at trends in crime, I mean, if, if, if you look at every negative trend in our school system, it all started going downhill when they took prayer out of school. That's a statistical fact. I didn't make that up. They took prayer out of school. They said it was illegal to teach Creation, they be, well, first they allowed them to teach both. Then they came along and said, wait a minute, you can't teach creation because that deals with a supernatural being and that's religion and we can't teach religion. So they kicked that out of school. So now they can't pray in school. They can't teach about creation in school. They, uh, they just teach them they're all nothing but smart monkeys. And we wonder why we're living in chaos. They've, they've made God illegal in school. I showed that video one time where it talked about all these shootings that happen in schools. Some of you might have seen it. Blackbird, Virginia, uh, Columbine. It, 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 I, there was probably about 20 of them where kids went into schools and started shooting, shooting off rounds. And, and at the end of that thing, somebody, they said, people were praying, God, why didn't you stop this? And the answer was, I'm not allowed in the school. Okay, reading the rest of this, and we're going to close. Verse 21, because, this is Romans chapter 1, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I was watching one of these uh, programs in, on the Science Channel. And they were talking about novas. You know what novas are? When the star explodes? There's one right now. And they said, we're made out of stuff that came out of the stars. They said, the stars are our father. That's what they said. I said, man, that's what got Israel into trouble. They worshiped the stars and the moon and the planets. And these are from, these are doctors. You know, brilliant people that have been to college, you know, masters of science and so forth. 
They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. God will give man whatever he wants. And that's what we're seeing. See, I pray for our nation. I pray for revival. I pray for God to move. But you know what? Our nation is in line for judgment. And it's not going to be stopped. It's coming. See, I, I happen to believe this. I'm not being fatalistic. I'm, I'm not being... But I, th I think our culture and our nation has gone beyond the point. God is giving us up. And we who are believers, we need to be ready. We need to prepare our hearts and our minds for what's going on in the world, in our, in our culture today. If you, if you walk into a place and you start talking about Jesus, they're not going to pat you on the back and applaud you. It says that God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Listen to, listen to what this says. They try to explain this away, but you can't. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. Whenever you see, if, when you watch a news program and they're talking about these decisions like they had in New York, they show the loving couples. You know, they're happy. Two men, two women. You know what? They're not the enemy. The 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 game. They're they're not the enemy. I so many people waste their time thinking, looking at them, and thinking they're the enemy. They're not the enemy. They're just they're just. A symptom. That's a symptom of a greater... And I've said this so many times. It's like the pimple that hides a big cancer. When a nation, when a culture, when a society turns its back on God, denies His existence, makes Him illegal, makes it just a matter of personal preference, then... All this stuff, the chaos begins to happen like what we're seeing right now. The restrictions are removed. The idea of a holy God that says what's right and what's wrong is removed. So you can do whatever you want. If it feels good, do it. That's why I grew up in the 60s. That was like, you know, if it feels good, do it, baby. Look at where it's gotten us. We'll just finish. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. He gave them over to a reprobate mind. Oh God, how, how close are we to Him giving the United States over? So go, ahead, go ahead. Do it. Go ahead. Pass the laws. Go ahead. Kick me out of school. Kick me out of Congress. Take me off the money. Go ahead. Go ahead. He'll let us do it. He's letting church... Churches are doing it. Churches are taking the cross off the wall. Churches are taking the, 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 the idea of the blood and the sin. They're taking all that stuff out. Because they, want, they don't want to offend people. They want, they want to bring more people in. Church, churches are going right along with the program. Go ahead. God will let you go. He'll give you everything you want. He'll turn you over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Well, we could spend a couple weeks on those things. 
But all you've got to do is read the newspaper. And you see that. It's a symptom of a nation reeling out of control. I don't care who sits in the White House. I don't care if they're Democratic, Republican. I don't care if they're liberal or conservative. We need to be anchored in Jesus. As believers, we need to be prepared to stand our ground against the onslaught that is coming and that is here. We don't need to wring our hands and say, Oh God, what's happening? He, 2,000 years ago, Paul told us what's, what's happening. Right here in Romans. Nothing new. This is higher tech now. That's what we got. You know, we got the, the texting. <laughs> Same thing. Could you just see if the Apostle Paul had an iPhone and he would... I hope and pray tonight, and I, this was kind of like a last minute thing because Todd just called me last night and told me he couldn't be here. But I hope and pray tonight that you grab a hold of something and realize that what's going on in this world, it looks crazy. God, this place is going crazy. It's the way of the world. We need to be about our Father's business. Amen? Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would cover us with your blood. Father, use us for your glory in this wicked, in this evil and perverse generation. Father, we pray for the lost. Father, those people who are out there that have been given, they've believed the lie, they've been given over to, to believing this stuff, Father. We, we have a generation of kids that were raised in school and never heard a prayer. You know, let me say one more thing before I close. I thank God. Now, this may sound strange. But there's a generation of kids that don't have a clue. You know what? I think God can do more with them than lukewarm religious people. You hear what I'm saying? I think God could do more with them. There's somebody that had never heard and is totally foreign. I think God can do more with that generation than folks who were raised in some lukewarm church somewhere. So, Father, I pray that you would help us reach out to this generation. Father, your word has never changed. It's still the truth. You've shown us and you told us, Lord, that you're a God who you loved us so much that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. Yet, Father, these things that are going on in the world, you're getting ready to pour your wrath out. God, I pray that even as Noah preached to a, a, a generation of people that turned their back on you. Father, I pray, God, that we would go out and preach and tell folks to come into the ark. Not necessarily this building, but into the household of faith. To get in, to, to get in uh, under the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, that we would, we would entreat people to come, forsake your evil ways, and turn to God. I pray, Lord, that you would show yourself powerful through our lives, that you would minister to those that we get around, that they would see us and sense that there's something about us that they can't get out in the world. Father, we're praying for salvation of lost souls, that folks would come and put their faith and trust in you. That when the time comes to die, we would know where we're going to spend our eternity. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ and all God's children.